Welcome to our closing plenary session, a call to action, amplifying trust. As those who've had the pleasure of attending previous sessions in this year's extraordinary meeting of Horasis know, this entire gathering is dedicated. loss of human life caused by COVID-19 is rebuilding public trust in our institutions. That's certainly true in the United States where some of the focus of our conversation will be today and it's where I live. And it's true as well virtually everywhere else in the world. The debates during this meeting have shown how we might overcome those disruptions by developing unity, inspiration and creativity. And ultimately how we can amplify trust. And over the next 45 minutes or so, we're going to put our three discussion leaders to the test and see if they can surface some strategies for doing just that. With that, I'd like to welcome our panelists. And please give a little wave, if you would, when I mention your name so that the audience knows who you are. Lynn Fritz is the proprietor of the Lynn Mara State Winery in the United States and a longtime entrepreneur in international logistics services. The company he ran, Fritz Companies, which employed as many as 11,000 people in 120 countries, was sold to UPS in 2001. The same year, he started Linco, which developed supply chain solutions, as well as the Fritz Institute, which has become a leader in operational and logistical effectiveness, particularly in the nonprofit sector. Murat Sietnepazov is CEO of Integral Petroleum, one of the largest exporters of oil in the Caspian Sea region. And for the past few years, he's also been chairman of Caspian Week at the annual World Economic Forum meeting in Davos, Switzerland, which every year seems to have one of the most boisterous and fun-looking parties on the promenade in Davos. Murat, who's from Turkmenistan, one of the five nations that border the giant inland Caspian Sea, continues to be a booster for that region. And finally, we have Vinod Sekar, who is chairman and group chief executive officer of the Petro Group in Malaysia whose business sprawls from rubber recycling to biotechnology to financial software and much more. Vinod is also the chairman of the Sekhar Foundation, based in Kuala Lumpur, and the CEO of Green Rubber. In addition to being an accomplished playwright and busy philanthropist, he also became the host of the first English language talk show on television in Malaysia. Welcome to all three of you. I'm Clifton Leaf, editor-in-chief of Fortune Magazine, Lynn, Murat, and Vinod, you're all businessmen who have long had a global purview. You've each had to learn the rules and customs of many other nations, enter into contracts with clients in dozens of venues around the world, and fundamentally build your global businesses on a foundation of trust. So the devolution of trust and the loss of credibility and authority of some key institutions over the past many months and we can go into some specifics in a minute here. This has been a challenge, I'm guessing, for each of your respective businesses. So first off, let me put, Lynn, let me put you on the hot seat here. Is this assumption correct? And how has it manifested itself? Yeah. Well, the assumption certainly that, that trust is an, an absolute uh, brick of a, having any kind of a successful business relationship. It's frankly one of the reasons I got into business is that to me, this was a education because if I was going to do business with the Nod or do business in Turkmenistan, the first thing I'd have to do is find out a lot about what they do and why they do it, what the customs, what the cultures are, and the rest. And this is really, to me, the, the underpinning of business, because once you get that done, you have contracts, but it's almost always personal. I don't care how big our companies are. I, uh, in the end of the day, if we were dealing in a triumvirate here in some fashion on a on a mutual business, we'd be talking the three of us, having lawyers do the rest, but it would be the underpinning would be an understanding and some kind of a simpatico, to use that word, uh, you know, of us being able to have a win-win situation through this, uh, you know, through this association that we uh, that we make. So, I mean, that was, it really was one of the reasons I wanted to go international as opposed to just to the United States, because I felt so strongly that business is the connecting rod. And I would submit, I guess, for this conversation, I, uh, you know, one way to re, 
uh, do, if you will, or amplify, to use your word, uh, you know, what trust is. I think the more business, the more international business. I've been a Republican all of my life, and we all used to believe in uh, in the United States, you know, in international trade. I, I find this bloody place totally unrecognizable now because, I mean, uh, there, this the America has receded into this, uh, you know, all for me and not for you and, uh, uh, and the rest of it, which is the total antithesis of what I'm talking about. And one reason I think that the United States was not only successful in a, uh, in, in a, you know, a worldwide association of both nations, political, but mostly in business uh, and the associations in business. So I, I, you know, I think more, more business, uh, less uh, uh, constraints like tariffs, less constraints, uh, uh, you know, like policy decisions uh, and a win-lose uh, thing will go a long way, in my estimation, on re-establishing, uh, re-establishing the trust I think a lot of us felt 10 or 12, 15 years ago. You know, that, that's a really nice framing. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, you, know, you know, I just want to get real here for a second. Are, is, has the trust issue been brought up in your boardroom conversations, in the executive suite, in your private conversations with other business leaders? How serious is this? Or is this the kind of thing that, that we in the sort of talk business, to, you know, think about in the think tanks and conferences like this? Is this, is this are, we at, are we reflecting a real issue and concern here? Well, I think we are. There's no question about it. That there is a trust deficit because we haven't, as businessmen, stepped up the plate yet. I mean, let me let me take this in another direction. I mean, we have an opportunity to not just regain any any trust that we've lost, but to actually take things forward uh, in 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 leaps. Right? We we have an opportunity to is essentially change the, the nature of what we've come become used to. Now, you talk about America, um, uh, in, in, in terms of what, what it's become now uh, and what you can't recognize. And I think the reason is you've lost sight of what true capitalism is in America. You know, we, we've gone on this rah-rah crusade about capitalism without understanding that true capitalism is sustainable wealth creation. Sustainable mm-hmm. wealth creation. Social capitalism. I know socialism is a dirty word. Um, and I know I'm not a socialist, and I and and I like my toys, and and I like making money. But true capitalism is wealth creation, and that means we need to lift everyone up. And this pandemic has affected everyone in historic proportions. And it's not just Malawi. If you look at Malaysia, the job losses, the loss of small and medium-sized enterprises that are collapsing by the day. The fact that for the first time in memory, we have Malaysians and I'm sure in America as well, that are wondering whether they have enough money to buy enough grocery and food the following week, if not the following day. And this is an opportunity for us as businessmen to come forward and realize that we have to lift everyone up. We have to play a role now and get that trust back from the people, from our market, the most important part of, of our business. Is, is, you know, I'm a businessman, right? I make money by selling, you know, uh, Lena product um, or, or Murata service. And how do I make more money? I find more of them. So I need them. Now, here's the thing. I want Lynn's money, but I need Lynn to have it before I can take it from them. So I have to play a role in lifting people out of poverty into the middle class so I can take their money. It's a selfish thing, but that's how it works. That's capitalism. That's true capitalism. Um, and I've always believed that business are the smartest people in the room. Right? We, at least we think so. Right? We, we, we take, uh, you know, we spin businesses. We, we rebuild businesses. We, we, we find markets for them. It's like a dying duck. We, we have the best chance in the world that will rebuild the bones, fix new arteries, pump new blood through. We have the best lawyers in the world that will go check it out and then certify that not only is this formerly dying duck now alive and well, it's doing really well. And then we have the best PR people, communication people, that will now tell the world, this duck is alive, well, and bloody hell, it's laying golden eggs. Now, imagine if we took a small percentage of that ingenuity and used it to fix socioeconomic problems. Imagine we used it to try and lift people up and find ways, innovative ways, of creating better markets by lifting people out of poverty, out of hardship, helping small and medium-sized enterprises. If we all did something, imagine what that would do to the landscape. And I think that's 
that's what we have to do as businessmen. We have to now understand that economic leaders can no longer not participate in social economic issues in the social world. We are part of it. It is where we make our money. It's how we how we build our businesses, and we have to be involved in ensuring that our community, our environment, the people that work for us, the people that we take money from, that they're all well. I think that's that paradigm shift that is possible because of the tragedies that occurred in the last one year. You know, first of all, that was beautifully said. Thank you, uh, Vinod. You know, this focusing, this framing of trust as being uh, essential within a context that business rely that, that is based on values, that it has a foundation of values that uh, that lift everyone up. And when we lose that sense of value about business, trust is the first thing to sort of go, uh, you know, right down cascading from top to bottom or bottom to top. But, you know, Murat, I want to I want to bring up, you know, the sort of elephant in the room, which is the pandemic and the economic disruption that it caused and the sense that so many people were thrust into unemployment or disrupted lifestyles or in some cases, uh, 37 million people around the world into poverty, extreme poverty. Um, you know, this is, is such an unusual circumstance, and it, it strained all of our relations in different ways. And this process had been happening for a while. You're on mute. You're on mute, Murat. It's the, uh, the it's the bane of our Zoom. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Clif uh, Clifton. Very interesting question uh, because uh, yes, uh, COVID pandemic disrupted uh, our lifestyle, disrupted a lot of businesses, and uh, but I think uh, at least what I believe, uh, we didn't lose trust to each other. What we probably lost is a trust to the institutions, to the international organizations, to the governments, uh, because they were not able at this necessary moment of time uh, to act properly and uh, in coordination between each other, even in, in internal coordination. And I can uh, give you a lot of examples, but uh, remember March, April, May 2020, where governments started to fight with each other for the masks and medical equipment, hijacking <laughs> planes and so on. And uh, I was thinking that time, this is the end of the globalization. And that the, mirror, uh, the, the world now uh, really uh, fell apart for the fragments. And who is stronger? He is the right. And it's a, it's a completely different uh, what we used to see for the previous decades after World War II, practically. And uh, here, uh, that's why I think what we need to concentrate, and not us, but we should stimulate that process, that these institutions should regain this trust uh, back. And if this will work, and the uh, COVID pandemic showed to us uh that uh, how bad consequences we can get from that and maybe this is a stimulation uh for the future uh and if uh, we will get uh, if all these institutions organizations uh, will regain the trust i think on the business level on the private level it will be much easier to do the same to follow uh, this is one uh, story. And the uh, second idea, uh, which I would like to tell, that uh, world, our world changed. And uh, maybe it is not so bad that this uh, our lifestyle changed. Because uh, if we will go back to the history, uh, we could see that normally such pandemics are followed or preceded by the uh, revolutions hmm. or the really turbulences in the world. Uh, let's go back, everybody knows Spanish flu, 1918. And just before that, there was a communist revolution in Russia, 1917. Yeah. After that, there was a series of revolutions in Europe. At the end, the world order was completely changed. And we got United States as a superpower, 
And some years later, 30, 40 years later, we got the Soviet Union as a superpower. Mm -hmm. Before that, uh, it was completely different history. The superpower was the British Empire, practically. Mm -hmm. uh, but because of, uh, th maybe this is my uh, assumption, maybe right, maybe wrong, but I think there is a certain connection. And now we got, 100 years later, another pandemic. Luckily, our healthcare system is not much uh, more and better developed than 100 years ago. Otherwise, we could have the same effect, like 500 million people infected and 50 million people died, which is official, let's say, statistics from that time. And, uh, uh, and now we see a pandemic happened. Uh, world was not prepared again. And now we are having consequences of this pandemic. And uh, uh, one of the consequences that the world started very fast digitalization. And now mainly people are working distantly from home. Even social life is now more virtual like we are having now uh, <laughs> in this conference. We are not able to gather and join together and meet each other. That's why we switch to the virtual uh, reality. And uh, uh, you know that five years ago, approximately, uh, the fourth industrial revolution was announced uh, by the World Economic Forum. And we were thinking, OK, it will take maybe 10 years, 15 years when we will start feeling it. But now, after the pandemic, in three, four months, we got all these uh, effects straight away to us. And uh, I see now in the program of Horasis, one, year, uh, one hour later, we will have the discussion about the fifth industrial revolution. Oh. And uh, things are now moving so fast, and uh, we should be uh, prepared. And maybe this is for good. Maybe this pandemic stimulated progress on the digitalization side. Now, uh, coming back to the trust, how uh, institutions, international organizations can gain the trust, regain the trust back? Uh, first of all, they should show us how they're effectively fighting with the consequences of COVID pandemic. And we start starting to see positive effects. Like we, we got massive vaccination finally after one year. Uh, now the other t task is uh, to follow up with the mutations of the, of the virus and maybe to adjust and invent new vaccines. And uh, th this is going on. But uh, another issue is how to be prepared for the next virus or next uh, pathogen, which could be even more harmful than the existing one. And uh, we've heard some forecasts that in two, three years, we'll get the new one. And yeah. here, uh, the international organizations should lead uh, this process and uh, j try to join the force, uh, whoever available and wh whoever is possible to contribute to this process. Well, let's, and, le let's leave the, the next pandemic for just a little bit. Let's <laughs> kind of deal with this one for now because, um, you know, we're still getting through this. But, but you know, I think, Lynn, we're at the point about the fact that revolutions seem to follow these uh, these cataclysmic events, these these exogenous events, as, as we in the business media always call them. Uh, right. It's really true. And what we've, we've already seen them really, really fast. We saw this digitization revolution, look what we're all doing. You know, we saw a, a biotech revolution to some extent with the Without speed that. of these vaccines we never imagined would happen so fast. Uh, we're seeing a political revolution, so it, you know, not just you know, in the United States, but everywhere, a, a complete change of power and, and a change of, of ideology sort of taking hold here. And there's so much that's happening now that it's, it's really fast. But I want to talk for just a second about a quiet revolution, which was the supply chain revolution. And this was one that you helped create. And that's why I want to bring it to you, Lynn. I, I mean, this idea of globalization was in everybody's, you know, the front of their lips for so long, for decades. But quietly, what people weren't realizing is that we had globalized, you know, the back offices, the productions, the processes, all of these things, the supply chains, you know, for, for decades uh, that was happening slowly and connecting us and creating these relationships. And one of the things that's come out of this pandemic is, is a pushback for that, a, a real blowback. People are saying, oh, we can't afford the disruptions of a supply chain halfway around the world. Uh, with all the potential disruptions, we're going to have to start bringing that stuff in house. And we're hearing that kind of conversation in U.S. business now. What does that say to you? It, it's it's scary. I mean, I 
really appreciate you know both uh, Murat and uh, Vinod's comments because I mean the 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 underpinning has to be a win-win of any relationship. I don't care whether it's your wife or your uh, you know your children. Everything's got to be win-win if it's going to be sustainable and that there's trust. What what you're seeing here was certainly with the uh, with a pandemic, of course, is fear. And once fear shows its head, then it's not win-win. It's survival. Uh, and humans have a much different train of thought in a survival. We're just made that way. That's a primordial element of the humans, and and uh, and so that has exacerbated uh, what was already there. I think uh, with a, with a, you know before the pandemic. To get back to your comment, though, the the yeah, we were very very involved, and everybody thought globalization, everybody, World Economic Forum, I mean, political uh, as well as uh, commercial elements on all levels believed that this was, if not a panacea, a a the next really generation graduation of human development in all respects, and it has been, it has been. Now that fear is back this this uh let's get it all back to america is a fear-based element pharmaceuticals are in china oh my god those masks like Barat was saying oh my god somebody else got the mask first we're going to japan or we're going to make our own and and this fear element uh you know comes in i i i this scares the hell out of me frankly and and i i think it, it also allows uh it allows enables uh more autocratic uh, uh, individuals to come to the fore. It allows more people to simply put trust in an individual as opposed to a system. Uh, and really what we're here to talk about is how can our institutions, which are all systems, and they're all basically value-based underneath these systems, just like globalization is a value-based thing, as you so well you know, put out. So it does scare me that, uh, that these fear Based elements are are impacting very negatively, in my estimation. I hope uh, they go away relatively. That's why I didn't like the tariffs. I don't like uh, any kind of trade impediments. And I really agree with Vinod. I, I think the the win win that he was suggesting, you got to yeah. have a market. You got to well, have I mean, people on both sides of the equation. That certainly goes for. know just from the data is that globalization has mostly lifted up the standard of living uh, around oh, yeah. the world it has been a, a tremendous boon for the for the quality of life for um, reducing in some cases some global disparities and and bring more people millions more people into the middle class um, but you know one of the things we've seen this blowback now and some of that blowback has come you know in a populist way but it's it's up to business leaders to really carry the torch for globalization, and, and too often they don't. Um, I, I won't name names here, but in the United States, we often, you know, we've had, you know, business leaders who will shy away from that. They'll, they'll hide behind this sort of populist rhetoric, and, and it really is imperative for business leaders to sort of rebuild that trust uh, about what global trade means. Yeah, that was exactly my point. I mean, it, it comes to the fore with business, business, Negotiated and, and and developed this inter you know web of uh, of globalization on all fronts and the politics went along with it because everybody was looking you know better for it. Now when fear comes in, it's I want mine because you know and it's better if I if you lose because it's the only way. Now I win. Anytime you have that, so I do really strongly agree with that. I'd be happy to hear the two other speakers' thoughts yeah. on that too. That in their countries. You know, if the if the business leaders can be up front and say, we believe in this, notwithstanding our party, notwithstanding our leadership or something of that nature, we're here. Uh, you know, it, uh, it would go, I think, a very, very long way because we have the jobs. The government doesn't. Or if we and if we don't do it, the government will have all the jobs, right. which has both happened in a few, uh, certainly in a few states. Well, let's hear Vinod's thoughts on this. OK, I think look, you're, you're, you're 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 absolutely right. Um, firstly, globalization has been more of of a boon than anything else. No, we can stop now. Once you say I'm absolutely right, we could just stop the conversation. You're the editor in chief. I'm I'm sucking up. Can't you see that? <laughs> 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 but, 
<laughs> but you know, the at the end of the day, it, it's been more of a boon than anything else. But here's the problem with everything, with human nature, greed. Right now, greed is neither. I, I'm sorry, I like analogies, but let me just tell, let me just, just describe it for you as far as from what I see. Now, greed is neither good nor bad. Greed just is. Right, it's just there. We're greedy for love. We're greedy for power. We're greedy for money. We're greedy for food. We're greedy for many things. It's just part of the human makeup. That's what we are. So it's neither good nor bad. But what we need, and what business leaders need to do, is temper greed. Just temper it. It's like having a powerful Bugatti. You know, this powerful sports car, seven liter engine, does zero to sixty in two point something seconds. And if you can't drive it well, you can't control it. It's going to hit a tree, or, or kill yourself, or kill somebody else. But if you can control it, if you can take the curves, slow down on the curves, accelerate on the straights, stop when you need to, and then take off again, then you have control over a very powerful engine because that's all greed is. So greed needs to be tempered, and that's what business leaders, what a lot didn't do in the globalization makeup. You know, they just went for the cheapest, the quickest, the fastest, without thinking. Well, how does it impact that that community where we're in now? How do we spread the wealth a little? And then it comes down to, well, what can I do for a hundred million that I can't do with 80 or 90? What can I do with 10 million that I can't do with eight? What can I do with a million that I can't do with 800,000? What can I do with a billion that I can't do with 800 million or 900 million? Now, when you look at it from that perspective, that's what's, that's what has been missing in the globalization world is that mindset to say, listen, we need to temper greed. We need to spread globalization in a way that there is some sort of balance because as you said, it's helped rebalance certain inequities. Globally. But when you go the other extreme, when you just look at profit and nothing else, and when you say, no, I need that billion because, damn it, why not? I want that extra hundred million. And, and, and you're willing to go that far, then you, 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 you've lost control of the engine, right? It, it's just going to do whatever it wants to do. And that's in many cases what we see. And that's why this, this, this pushback, uh, this, this, this extreme pushback sometimes. And again, I go back to the fact that here's the opportunity. It's almost the universe has created this opportunity for us businessmen to, okay, let's, let's do paradigm shift. Let's, let's now take it the way it's meant to go. I'm a hardcore capitalist. I want to make money. And that's the, that's the thing. You don't need to sacrifice to do the right thing. You don't need to give up your toys as a businessman. You don't need to give up your beautiful houses, your plane, the boats, whatever it is. It's just tempering greed and then say, okay, like, how do we, you know, lift everything up more? And it's that rebalance that will bring globalization back, I think, uh, to an understanding where everyone says, yes, this is good for us. You're on mute. Yeah, Cliff, you're on mute. Mute. The moderator's on mute. Now, this, you know, the editor-in-chief of Fortune magazine has never been, you know, muted like yeah, that. Yeah, Well, you know, you told me I, I was right, and I just, I just fell asleep on the job. Uh, I was just about to uh, to praise some of the questions in the in the comment section, and if you click on comments, uh, you'll be able to see some of them. Um, we've got a couple of really good ones from Dr. Cora Butler Jones uh, and from David Goldsmith. I want to I want to take one of David's comments to you, Vinod, which is okay. Got it. How? What's the plan? Uh, which is a pretty good uh, it's a pretty good question to ask. So let me ask you that if you could answer that kind of quickly, because I want to get Murat back into here too, and Murat. You might also address that question as well. What's the plan? How do we move forward? We know, we know we've got a problem with trust. How do we move forward? Me or Murat? Why don't you, you, you start, start Vinod, since you, since you teed it up for, for everyone? Okay, well, look, at the end, it's already there. What's the next step? It's, it's individual companies. It, it's individual business leaders. You see, we don't have to go change 100 people's lives. We don't have to change a million people's lives. We don't have to impact 10 people or 100 people. We just need to see what can we do within our community, within our company. How do we change mindsets? I consider CSR a dirty word. And a lot mm -hmm. of people get upset with me. But to me, it is a dirty word because it allows companies just to tick a box. Oh, you know what? I donated 100 trees, 1,000 trees. It's on the roadside. You know, go ahead and plant it. And I'm done. I've done my CSR. I've done my service to society. It needs to be part of the lifeblood of a company. And the only way it becomes a part of the lifeblood is when leadership shows them the way, makes them believe that this is the right thing to do. Let me give you an example of what I did with my company. Um, now, this year has been a hard year. Last year has been a hard year. Uh, most companies have cut salaries. Most companies have, 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 have had to let go of staff. Um, in, in Petra, we made a decision that below a certain level, people needed to survive. 
So we gave them uh, three months bonus. Uh, but below that, not, not for the senior execs because I can't afford that. But below that, we, we gave them uh, three months bonus. But we did it differently. We said, you know what? Two months is for you. One month, you tell us somebody that needs help. Your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your cousin, your friend that this pandemic has affected uh, econom- economically. And we will send that one month to them to say, by the way, this person has asked for her, their bonus to be given to you. Wow. Uh, and it empowers them. It makes them feel, my God, I can, I can actually make a difference in somebody's life. But they actually now feel it. It's their money that's gone to them. And we've yes. seen how that impacted everyone, how it's changed mindsets. And I think this is where it happens. We change the way businesses operate by making sure leadership changes the way people think in their companies. And, and how you help they- foster a connection between people that, you know, or reinforce a connection between friends or family members. Or whatever. What, a, what a great idea. <clears throat> you know, I agree with you about the CSR issue and infected fortune. We are, um, we are focused on what we call the change the world ethos, which is that you, we're, we highlight companies that are doing well by doing good. Uh, and, and so as part of their core operating business, this is not something they do with their CSR, or their marketing arms, or their foundations, but something in the way they are addressing a societal issue that they, they can change or fixing, an unmet, uh, fixing a problem or meeting an unmet need, all as part of their core operating business. And so that's, we do focus on that, and I think you're absolutely right on that. Murat, um, you know, I want to follow up on the getting it right thing, and we heard some great examples from uh, Vinod. Uh, how do you see, what do you see as a key initial step to regain trust, uh, particularly among business leaders? Okay. Uh, first of all, I will come back to Vinod's comments uh, about the temperate grid. And uh, there is another solution, which is very simple and very fast, called progressive taxation. Mm-hmm. To redistribute wealth. If somebody really earning a lot of money, especially during the crisis pandemic time, let's increase uh, the taxation for such people for the period of time uh, while uh, situation will not be normalized. And this is just one comment. Now, uh, with, with regards to the digitalization, uh, I agree that uh, on short term, uh, a lot of things uh, were disrupted and a lot of people uh, were suffered because of the dig- digitalization, uh, like forced digitalization uh, by the pandemic. But on the mid-term and long-term, I think that uh, this should come back uh, because uh, now the barriers to get the education are much lower than before. You can just go distant and uh, for quite small money, you can get proper education. The same like before, you should pay or maybe ten or tens or hundreds of times more. Now, uh, with regards to the job, uh, now you can get a job uh, not dependently where are you based and uh, practically uh, geographical barriers also will disappear. And we will see uh, again mid-term, long-term, uh, it will be better distribution of jobs uh, between the people involving uh, the people who, can, uh, who cannot now get proper job and cannot get proper salary for, the, for, for what they are doing. And, uh, and they, this potentially uh, could automatically help to regain the trust into the system, uh, also into the business, because I am the businessman. Uh, I'm uh, living in Switzerland, for example, and uh, Switzerland is not the cheapest country in the world. And uh, when uh, I need to have my people physically in the office, of course, I will hire people from Switzerland, from that city, and I will pay them salaries as per the Swiss standards. But if I can delegate some jobs on distance to the other countries, I will be happy to do this because some other countries you should pay 10 or maybe 20, 30 times less. And this, uh, these market mechanisms automatically will regulate this issue. And then at the end, uh, and, uh, and, and then I will have possibility to develop business uh, in the other countries. Before, it was very difficult because I was concentrating really to have people in Switzerland and develop business here. But now I am stimulated by the digitalization to go worldwide. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, this uh, uh, and trust here is, a, is a, like a consequence. It's not the uh, origin. Uh, and uh, slowly, slowly, 
if uh, this movement will go on, uh, we will have distributed works worldwide everywhere for any business generally. And already a lot of platforms now existing. Just today I discussed on this uh, networking event uh, about one of these platforms. And I think this is automatic proce process. Just we need to uh, define short term, mid term and long term pers perspectives. Mm -hmm. And the long term perspectives, everything should be fine. This is my opinion. So a few years ago, when the economy was booming and the stock market was going through the roof, the, the rich kept getting richer, the poor didn't quite benefit from that. When the pandemic happened and there were job losses and economic fragility, the rich still got richer. The markets kept going up. Uh, many people didn't mind working from home. You know, they got to see their families. They got to work out in the Hamptons or in Northern California or, or Malaysia or wherever, Switzerland, um, but the poor got poorer. And, and this is part of the challenge um, that we have fundamentally that's driving this gap of trust is this disconnect between what people say and then their increasing ability to sort of be separate from the rest of the world for their, uh, their wealth. Lynn. Well, how, how do we deal with that? The... <laughs> uh, Bernard, I'll, I'll pass that one to you. Uh, and, you know, I think you I, and I, I don't mean, I mean it because the, in the United States, I, uh, uh, there are so many elements, uh, you know, to this. The, the, uh, in one hand, we, I think we need another 10 million immigrants in the United States for jobs. And I mean for all, not just the more menial jobs, but a whole variety of level jobs that in itself will be, and, you know, turn more people, more restaurants and more of that people that have been suffering. Uh, the fact the the reason there is this disconnect is that uh, the wealthy are going to the Hamptons and they got their gated community and they have their wealth and they're all making 10 or 15 percent on their investments with no thing. And they're not actually spending any money. I mean, curiously. Uh, uh, and so we're, we're not at all addressing uh, the dynamics of people like that. 50% of our population, we're not talking you know, in 10% of the population. And I, I think a stimulus uh, uh, through, I know that sounds, uh, but you're looking for a plan. Uh, it, you know, I think immigration, in my mind, and there are a lot of statistics, a lot of books written on this, they're not popular now because of the fear factor uh, throughout countries. Immigration is bad. We we'll all lose our jobs. But as Murat said, that's actually not really happening. Uh, the, the, you can get jobs anywhere. So I would say one thing that I, to have a, at least in the United States, I, I can't speak, uh, you know, for Malaysia, you know, or, or certainly the Caspian Sea or, or for Switzerland, but I, I could say with comfort uh, for, the, uh, for the United States. My company, Fritz Companies, I, I, you know, as I said, we had a lot, about 11,000 people, about six or 7,000 here in the United States. They're all, I mean, I would say over 30% of that 6,000 were first time people in the United States. They were immigrants and only because they were sexual, they could do things and they, and we could train them and it was easy and we profited and so did they and so did their families. So I, uh, we need more people that are going to generate the, uh, the dynamics. I'd love to take a discussion on that because I know it's not necessarily a, uh, uh, thought that would be embraced by a lot of people, but I thought we'd mix it up here a little well, bit since so you put me on the spot. It, I did, I did. You know, and I, I should put myself on the spot a little bit because I want to talk a little bit about um, about facts and the, and the challenge of I, I, the fact I, that I, facts stopped to mean something over the past year or two or three or whatever it's been. Um, uh, you know, this idea that, that people didn't trust the media, and I may be one you know, 20 millionth of the media uh, representing fortune, but, but understanding getting letters from, you know, we do very deep dive stories on, on companies and, and leaders and, you know, people coming back and sort of being mistrustful in a way that they hadn't been in the 91 years that we were publishing. Um, you know, people not trusting the government, uh, certainly not trusting political leaders. The, the idea that people could just say things that just weren't true and get away with it or create enough doubt so that somebody wondered about that. You know, Vinod, uh, you're laughing and actually, Murat, you're both laughing. So I usually yeah, I, 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 I need to take this one. Uh, but no, but I, I would love to get your thoughts on this because we have to kind of address this at the core, you know, right. when facts stop to 
be facts. Yeah. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's about, look, like it's hope or the lack of it. Okay. Yeah. Because what you had in America is the perpetuation of fear and ignorance. And fear and ignorance always leads to hopelessness. Yeah. It's fear and ignorance. Let's be honest. These people that are fighting immigration in America are immigrants. All right. Maybe two or three generations or one generation, but they're immigrants. And, right. you know, I, I see Indians rallying for, for your former president about, you know, keep these immigrants out. They're fucking Indians. Oh, excuse my language. They're Indians. <laughs> you know, from, from India. It's absurd. It's absurd. I agree with you. It's not about race or religion. It's fear. Right? It's fear and ignorance. Uh, and that brings hopelessness. So that's what we have to address. Right? Whether in America or anywhere else, we have the same problem in Malaysia. You know, when, when there's fear and ignorance, they go to the, the, the same place all the time. Right? The, 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 you know, the, what, what's ours? How do we keep what's ours? Why should we share what's ours? Without realizing when you open up and you let people in, it's an opportunity. It's a bigger market. It's, it's, and and it's, that, it's that mindset. And that's, again, leadership. Now, you know, political leadership is what we always went to, right? We always, it's, it's America. You expect the president, the senators, your congressmen. You, you expect them to lead. Uh, businessmen stayed back and said, we make money. Hey, we, we drive the economy. We fund the government. We give, you know, we give our taxes and we back off. And I think that's what has to change. Because if we're going to change the mindset of people, if we're going to create hope by alleviating fear and ignorance, it has to be us going in there and saying, look, guys, this makes us money. If it makes us money, it creates employment. If it makes us money, it allows all of you uh, to have better jobs, to be able to buy better things. Uh, and it's these people that come in that create market, that create opportunity, create and, and, and are willing to do jobs that you're not willing to do, which you don't admit to. There are, you're absolutely right, Lynn. There are jobs, but yeah, they yeah. don't do those jobs. <laughs> you yeah. know, so, one tactical thing too, just you know, to interrupt too, because it is what kills trust is lies and untruths. I don't care whether it's your personal life, your business life, your so, and anything. And what you're saying, what you brought up so well, you know, is now the media. Uh, who can trust the media? Uh, Etc. Well, my one tactical thing that I would suggest, and we certainly I've, I've raised some money with different people on this, is to is to make all of the uh, social media that is portraying any kind of portraying themselves as any kind of a news outlet, uh, you know, to say to go on the same rigor that you have, journalistic rigor, where you actually can be sued for falsehoods for pure. I, I, uh, uh, you know, the, and they, and, uh, and, and, and have these others and say, we are opinion, you know, opinion news, I uh, and make some, make the people, whoever these social medias are and whatever thousands they are have to declare one or the other, because the joinder of these two, it, it, you, you, you don't know where one stops and one starts anymore, sadly. And, and, uh, I think this would go a long, long way to, uh, uh, you know, eliminating, not eliminating, reducing uh, this misinformation uh, and this fear mongering that uh, the note and Murat both you know, brought out, which does, just like greed, fear is that one other element of the human condition that if you if you tease it, it ain't going to go well. Greed, if you don't harness it, as he said, will not go well. So what can we do? Well, we can do tactical as well. One other thing I'll say about you too. I mean, on the on the on on publications is write more stories about guys like Vinod that are actually being very successful, you know, by actually doing something for his employees and the rest. To so it's as an example, if you're in a public company, you you know, then instead of just checking the box, uh, and I, uh, you know, you can say no. These are practices that we do, and why our people that work for us from the lowest grade love us. These people love working here, uh, et cetera. And, and it would also profile, you know, the lower edge of our companies, not the hierarchy, the, you know, the business executives that get all the print like all of us have, myself. All right. Well, that's a pretty good pitch for a story. Thank you. Uh, we have 30 seconds left, Rod, uh, to, to sort of wrap us up a little bit. 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah, it's a way to be nice. Uh, sorry. 
Yes, uh, first of all, America is a nation of immigrants. And it uh, depends how many generations before uh, you, you were the immigrant. That's why there's not, nothing strange. First, second, uh, governments, they have all necessary tools and mechanisms how to regulate, including this uh, uh, difference in the wealth and salaries. Uh, and uh, this is the task of the governments. And how to force the politicians uh, to keep their promises, this is a different story. Uh, but uh, there are good examples in the world how this could be done. And let's take even Switzerland for that. Uh, this is like really direct democracy. And here, I think I need to leave because I, I have the closing session. Yeah, we have but, a... <laughs> it was it was Yeah, I'm going to thank everybody for this really lively, fantastic conversation. Thank you, uh, Lynn, Vinod, and Marat. Uh, fantastic. Really appreciate your. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you for your moderation. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye.